Oh. Meow again. Tricks. What did I tell you? What did I tell you, Tricks? You just can't be opening the door for everybody. What if they're not one of our subscribers? No, no, Norman. How in the world am I ever going to get a video out without the whole world knowing first? Nothing surprises you, is it? You better start doing your job and quit ignoring me. Well, y'all, as you can see, got a jeweler's loop right here. And I guess you caught me doing something strange. But it's not that strange. You see, last night, as I was trying to answer some comments on another video, I had a National Geographic program that I was listening to. All about those microplastics that are polluting our seawaters. And after I listened to it for a while, I thought, hmm, you know, if it's polluting seawater that bad, what about plastic and sea salt? You know, I use that. And I started using it a few years back, maybe around 8, 10 now, because it was supposed to be so much better for you than, you know, standard table salt, which, you know, everybody was saying was so refined. You know, even though it's mined out of deep earth. So I really didn't look into it. I just went ahead and got some of that sea salt. And then here a year or two back, you know, everybody on TV and YouTube started using that there Himalayan ping salt. So, I got me some of that too. And you've seen me using it from some of my cooking videos. But, like I said, I got thinking about microplastics in the seawater. And I thought, well, you know, I'm an engineer, process engineer. If microplastics are contaminating the seawater, would they also be in sea salt? So, I did a Google search. And lo and behold, about this same time, well, exactly October 17th or October 18th, in 2018, this all came to light. It was on like CBS and The Guardian reporting on it, Forbes, and several other outlets. Now, I never heard about it. Maybe y'all did. But it really never gained much traction. Then I did a YouTube search, and there were a couple videos on it too. And now, be it, the views weren't very high. And you would think people would be concerned. You know, I mean, we're concerned about consuming BPA, which is from the plastic lining in uh, our cans. You know, like canned vegetables, can canned tomato sauce, what have you. You'd think we'd be just as much concerned about sprinkling uh, our daily uh, food with a daily dose of plastics. But apparently we weren't. Because as quickly as this issue is brought up, faded away. I never heard about it or caught on. So with all that said, I thought I'd go into my kitchen and see what I have. Of course, that's when y'all walked in and got me trying to eyeball some without having to break out the old microscope. And let me show you what I got. Now what I got here in this uh, first uh, paper plate is some of the pink Himalayan salt. It's supposed to be the good stuff. Well, I'll go over that later. Then right here, well that's a uh, sea salt. And this is a uh, baleen. And this is actually Mediterranean sea salt. It's supposed to be really good product of France. 
And then uh, it says right here, naturally white salt. Salt produced on protected sites. So, I mean, I bought this to cook with, thinking I was doing a good thing. And then right here is, you know, just good old everyday American table salt. You know, comparable to Morton's. But this is a great value brand. Doesn't have no iodine in it. So what I was trying to do with this jeweler's loop is see if I could see anything in these. And can't see nothing in the rock salt, of course. Now granted, the particle size of the plastics are very small. Couldn't see it in the table salt. But over here on my greatest and bestest Himalayan pink salt, I did see a little black speck in it. I wish I could show you. I've tried to put the jeweler's loop on the camera and focus it. That ain't working. But that's where I'm at. Let me take you in on a computer there and show you what I'm talking about, okay? Just so y'all can be informed, make the appropriate decision. Because from what I've read, we really don't know what the consequences of. Uh, from what I've read, we really don't know about the consequences of ingesting this plastic over time and over our lifetimes. So come on in. Let's take a look at it now. Okay, y'all. Since uh, it was a National Geographic show that I was watching on microplastics in uh, our uh, seas and oceans, I thought it was only appropriate when I did my Google search that I came across a National Geographic article. And let me show you the headline of that right now. And this is from the nationalgeographic.com. Uh, I'll leave a link to this below the video in the description. And what it says right here is microplastics found in 90% table salt. A new study looked at sea, rock, lake salt sold around the world. Here's what you need to know. Microplastics were found in sea salt several years ago. But how extensively plastic bits are spread throughout the most commonly used seasoning remain unclear. Now, new research shows microplastics and 90% of the table salt brands sampled worldwide. Of 39 salt brands tested, 36 had microplastics in them, according to a new analysis by researchers in South Korea and Greenpeace East Asia. Using prior salt studies, this new effort is the first of its scale to look at the geographical spread of microplastics in table salt and their correlation to where the plastic pollution is found in the environment. The findings suggest that human ingestion of microplastics via marine products is strongly related to emissions in a given region. And this was said by Shungku Kim, a marine science professor at Incheon National University in South Korea. Salt samples from 21 countries in Europe North and South America, Africa, and Asia were analyzed. The three brands that did not contain microplastics were from Taiwan, refined sea salt, China, refined rock salt, and rock salt is a mine salt from the earth, and France, unrefined sea salt produced by solar evaporation. The study was published this month in the journal of environmental science and technology. Now, if you want to read that article, you just click right here and it'll take you over to that article. We're going to return back to the National Geographic article. The density of microplastics found in salt vary dramatically among different brands, but those from Asian brands were especially high, the study found. The highest quantities of microplastics were found in salt sold in Indonesia, Asia is a hot spot for plastics pollution, and Indonesia, with 34,000 miles coastline, 
ranked an unrelated 2015 study as suffering the second worst level of plastic pollution in the world. In another indicator of geographic density of plastic pollution, microplastics levels were highest in sea salt, followed by lake salt and then rock salt. The new study is the fifth on salt published in recent years. Others have been done in Spain, China, the United States, and by a group from France, Britain, and Malaysia. Now folks, if you'd like to see any of these studies and read them in detail, you just have to click right here where they are underlined in yellow and it'll take you to the individual studies that were done where you can look at them in great detail. I will also leave a link to this website which is a study conducted by the United States for y'all as well in the description below on the video. But something I want to note here is this study not only looked at salt but also looked at tap water and I want to come back to that a little bit later in the video. It also looked at beer which is rather surprising and then of course it looked at sea salt. But I want to scroll down here to uh, the results of sea salt since that's what we're talking about at the moment. And what you're going to see here in this study is they're going to be talking about anthropogenic debris. And that's just a fancy scientific term for things that are generated by humankind. Uh, basically, plastics. And what they have here is anthropogenic debris was found in 12 brands of commercial sea salt that were tested. As with beer, each brand was processed three times and one of the samples was selected at random be filtered a second time with the particles from the second filtration added to the sample. An average of three trials for each brand was taken and then the number of particles found in the corresponding deionized blank was subtracted in order to report the most conservative numbers. Brand averages ranged from 46.7 to 806 particles per kilogram. <coughs> with an average mean of 212 particles per kilogram. And it says see table 7. So all you have to do to see this table is click on it and it will bring it up in another screen which we have it right here. It tells you the brands of salt that were tested. And right here the, you can see North Sea Salt or rather not so much the brands is where they came from. North Sea Salt, Celtic Sea Salt 1, Celtic Sea Salt 2, Sicilian Sea Salt, I take it that was off the coast of Sicily, Mediterranean Sea Salt 1, Mediterranean Sea Salt 2, Utah Sea Salt, which would could be uh, Lake Salt, or it could be mined. Himalayan Rock Salt, which is mined, Hawaiian Sea Salt, Baja sea salt, Atlantic sea salt, and Pacific sea salt. So what they did by taking these samples was they were looking at the degree of contamination based on the origin of the area where the salt was harvested from the seawater. Then what they have here to the right is particles per 50 grams sample and particles per kilogram. And the surprising thing to me here was not the fact that they all had particles in all the salts from all the different areas, but the fact that Pacific Sea Salt had a maximum of 51 particles per 50 grams, a minimum of 22, but the most outstanding thing that I noticed here was Himalayan rock salt which I use. I use Himalayan pink salt. Now Himalayan rock salt is a mine salt from within the earth. That's a little disturbing that it would be polluted with plastic as well and I think I know why and I'll discuss that towards the end of the video. Now 
as you can see, the Himalayan salt had 13 particles minimum per 50 grams or 37 maximum. You can look at that over here per kilogram that had 367 was the mean. So the mean, the average between all samples tested was 367. And here again, the highest would be Pacific sea salt at 806 particles per kilogram. So, among all samples analyzed, a total of 461 anthropogenic particles were identified. The vast majority, 93.3% of these, were classified as fibers. And down here below, they show you a couple of pictures of those, what they look like under magnification. And they give you a scale at the bottom to show you the size. Now, these are plastic fibers. where 99.3% of all the particles found were indeed plastic fibers. And for those of you not aware of it, a lot of the clothes we wear, and you may be wearing right now, have plastic in the weave. Whether that be polyester, polypropylene, polyethylene, most of us are familiar with polyester. You'll buy a shirt, it'll say 50% cotton, 50% polyester. It will be some type of mix, unless you're specifically buying a 100% cotton garment. And it goes on here to tell you the length of the fibers, which was anywhere from uh, 1.09 millimeter with a range of 0.1 tenth of a millimeter to five millimeters. Five particles greater than five millimeter were omitted. Don't understand why that would be. Of the 12 salt samples, eight had one or more particles in the second filtration step for a total of 23 particles. So, by filtering it twice, still did not remove all the microplastics. The average length of the particles found in the second filtration was 1.05 millimeters, about 0.04 millimeters smaller than the particles found in the samples as a whole. Similar, and this is something we all need to understand right now, similar to the tap water and beer results. The most common, common particulate color was blue, followed by red, pink and then clear. So like I say this study not only looked at sea salt they also looked at tap water and beer. Not sure why they chose beer except they were also looking at regional water supplies that are used to make the beer in America. And then they give you a breakdown of the particle colors here. And then it goes in to a discussion on what was found with the tap water which we'll come back to at the end of the video and why that's important. So we'll return back to the National Geographic article right here and continue down and here it says Sherry Mason a professor of the State University of New York in Fredonia who partnered with researchers at the University of Minnesota on a separate salt study said in an interview the new findings add another piece to the puzzle to assessing the impact of microplastics the fact that they found higher counts in Asia is interesting. While not surprising, you still have to have the data, she says. The earlier studies found traces of microplastics and salt products sold in those countries, but we haven't known how much. And then we get down to the question I was thinking about and what was on my mind, not only from myself now, I'm about to be 64, a lot of my life is done past the dam, but I do have children that are in their early 30s. I do have a grandson that just turned 12. So my interest is in more their health as well as mine. So is this harmful? And this is where there's a big huge question mark. Nobody knows. The new study estimates that the average adult consumes approximately 2,000 microplastics per year through salt. And that's only if you're 
consuming this amount of salt in your daily diet that's recommended. Most Americans get four to six times that much salt because of consuming fast food and processed foods. Now, what that means remains a mystery. A separate study by the University of York in Britain that sought to assess the risk of microplastics to the environment published Wednesday concluded not enough is known to determine if microplastics cause harm. The review of 320 existing studies found major knowledge gaps in scientific understanding of the impact of microplastics. The studies examined different types of microplastics including microbeads, fragments, and fibers, leading to a mismatch of data that makes comparison akin to comparing apples to pears. Alistair Boxwell, University of York geography professor and co-author of the study said in a statement. In other words, they weren't studying like kinds of plastic particles. They threw everything into the mix and therefore the data is not representative. Based on our analysis, there's currently limited evidence to suggest microplastics are causing significant adverse impacts, he said. There is an urgent need for better quality and more holistic monitoring studies alongside more environmentally realistic effective studies on particle sizes, material types that are actually in the environment. So, it's not if there's plastic in our salt or if any of them are without. Like this article says, and once you do your Google search, you're going to find dozens more. They're all going to say the same thing. 90% of all salt is contaminated with microplastics. And that's just a fact. So, now what I'd like to discuss, now what I'd like to discuss is why I feel that rock salt, which is mined from ancient seabeds that were created millennium before plastics, sometimes millennium before humans could possibly be contaminated or as the study shows is contaminated with microplastics so let's take a look at that so now I'd just like to touch briefly since I was so surprised that the Himalayan salt was uh, contaminated with microplastics too how I think it is getting contaminated and where we're at now is actually a, a Morton Salt uh, article here. It talks about how they mine their salt, which we're all familiar with Morton. And it's mined as well, deep within the earth. But what I want you to see here is this particular picture. This is typical of an underground salt mine. And if you look at that wall of salt in the picture, you'll see that throughout entire wall there are lighter and darker layers those layers comprise the salt and other sediments organic materials that settled in this ancient seabed now once the salt is mined it also they're going to mine the other sediment that's not salt and they're going to have to get rid of the other sediment that was mined with the salt to do that, part of the refining process is to wash the salt. And this helps wash away debris, sediments, other inorganic and organic material that was mined with the salt. Now, here's how I think the rock salt is getting contaminated. So, we jump back to that National Geographic site where it showed the four different studies, or there's actually three studies here referenced, and we're going to click on the one done by the United States where they were t testing for microplastics not only in sea salt, but in beer and tap water. 
and we're going to stroll down to the results for tap water. We've already looked at the results for uh, seawater. We're not going to be looking into beer today. Y'all can do that when you would like to. <clears throat> so, here it is. Here's the results that they found for tap water. During the first four months of 2017, tap water samples were collected from 14 countries worldwide, representing seven distinct regions. Samples were processed individually with the number of anthropogenic particles per sample calculated as the sum of the number of particles within the first and second filtration less the numbers of particles found within that day's deionized blank. So what they were doing is they were filtering the tap water twice and they were comparing it to deionized tap water. If you're not familiar with deionization process, that is the most thorough way to remove particulate, toxins, chemicals, and other impurities from water, whether it be seawater, tap water, or what have you. Given some variability in the sample volume, the density of the anthropogenic particle contamination was calculated as a number of particles per liter of water in order to standardize the samples. Anthropogenic debris was found in 81% of the 159 samples tested. The range of anthropogenic particles within all tap water samples was 0 to 61 particles per liter, with an overall mean of 5.45 particles per liter. The highest mean for any country was found in the U.S. with 9.24 particles per liter while the four lowest means were from European Union nations. Three brands of bottled water were also included in the study. The average of these non-municipal water source was 3.57 particles per liter. So folks, there's still microplastics even in your beloved bottled water. On a side note, which was less than the overall average. Interestingly, when the mean of all developing countries was compared with the mean of all developed countries, a statistical significant difference was found between the two groups. Water sourced more from developed nations, EU, US, and Lebanon, had an average density of 6.85 particles per liter, while water sourced from less developed nations, Cuba, Ecuador, India, Indonesia, Uganda, had an average density of 4.26 particles. Now, that seems sort of strange that developing nations would have less particles in a liter of water than developed. But it wouldn't if you consider those countries have not been using plastics nearly as long as developed countries have. And here again, they have you a chart thing where you can bring up those results. You can see here what countries the water came from, number of samples that were tested, the minimum and max maximum particles per liter. And uh, down here for bottled water, they tested three different types. The minimum was 1.78 particles per liter. The maximum was 5.37. For USA sampled water, 33 different samples. The minimum was zero, so apparently some of the samples had no microplastics in them, while some had up to 60.9 particles per liter. Now why is this important to know that the tap water is also polluted with microplastics? Well, the fact that if you're drinking tap water, well, then you're also consuming microplastics, which probably is not a good thing. Now, the fact that bottled water, three of the types they tested also had microplastics in it, here again, is uh, alarming to me. You wouldn't think that would be possible. But the reason I wanted to bring up this study about the tap water was in the processing of mine salt, like I said earlier, they use water 
most likely from municipal sources, in the cleaning process of the salt to wash out other impurities, like I said. So in my mind, that during the processing of the mined rock salt, the washing stage of that is what is contributing to contaminating the mined rock salt with microplastics. And that's just my thought, and that's my uh, thought based on my own opinion and experience as a process engineer. It's just good to know that our tap water is also polluted, as is at least three types of bottled water. Now the problem I have with the U.S. study as with the other studies and you can go through them and read them in detail, is we have no way of knowing what salt brands were tested. They just gave the different origins and regions from where the salt came from in correlation to the oceans and seas where the seawater originated that they used to harvest the salt from. Here again on the tap water results, we have no way of knowing in what areas of the U.S. or any other part of any other countries where the water was collected from to be tested. And we don't know the brand, again, of the bottled water. So we're sort of left in the dark. As you saw in the tap water study, some of the samples had zero microplastics in it. I think for those of us that want to know, are we ingesting microplastics not only in our salt, we'd want to know what brands. We'd also want to know if we are ingesting microplastics in our tap water or bottled water, we'd want to know which brands. But at this point, I can't find any results within this study that will tell us what brands are better, which brands are worse, which ones don't have any microplastics at all, unfortunately. Now, the last thing I want to discuss is, indeed, is there salt out there that we can purchase that doesn't contain microplastics. And I found two brands that they say their salt does not. So let's take a look at them. So y'all, I found two brands of salt that say they don't contain any plastic. And here we are on the first of two. And that's a uh, Jacobson Salt Company. And what they're saying here is Jacobson Salt Company's filtration ensures plastic free salt. And this was published, published the 4th of February 2019 of this year. Recently a report detailed the proficiency of microplastics in various table and sea salts from around the world. Jacobson Salt Company is proud to report our processes and strict standards ensure no microplastics are found in our Oregon sea salt. I have reviewed the aforementioned study and have found that microplastic particles found in sea salts and other products range in size from 344 microns to 686 microns, said Paul Sell, Jacobson's Salt Company's salt production lead. Since we filter all our seawater through 5 to 10 micron filters, none of those particles, if present, make it into our sea salt. Between Jacobson Salt Company's rigorous filtering process and pristine nature of Nitarts Bay, customers can salt freely knowing our flakes are pure and free of contaminants. Microplastics are a growing concern in our planet's water ecology. 
according to the National Ocean Service. The cosmetics industry started using microbeads in the 1970s, which were small enough to pass through water filtration systems and into our oceans and lakes. Former President Obama signed the Microbead Free Water Act of 2015, banning plastic microbeads in cosmetics and personal care products. The act marked a large step in the right direction to cleaning up our oceans, aquatic life, and waterways. Unfortunately, other sources of microplastics linger in the form of larger plastics breaking down to smaller sizes. So there you have it, folks. Jacobson saying their salt is plastic free. But that said, I just want us to go back to that U.S. study that was conducted that we followed the link from the National Geographic article. So let's return over to that briefly, okay? Okay, here we're back on the site of the United States study on the anthropogenic contamination, which is microplastics. And let's go down here and see how they tested the different salts, okay? And here we are. And this is under sample processing. We'll get down here to the sea salt. Sea salt samples were processed using a method similar to that used for beer samples described above. Exactly 50 grams of salt were measured and dissolved in one liter of millipore deionized water before it was vacuum filtered through a 70 millimeter diameter Wattman cellulose filter with a pore size of 11 microns. Now if you'll remember that their findings were that they filtered the water once and found microplastic particles. Then they took that same sample that had already been filtered one time and they filtered it a second time. And they did this across all the samples of salt that they sampled. And even though they filtered it a second time, they still found microplastics in the salt. Now granted the study was using an 11 micron filter and Jacobson's says right here that they use a filter they filter theirs through a 5 to 10 micron filters which would be even smaller than the pore size of the filtration filters that was used during the US study. So indeed quite possibly Jacobson could be absolutely right that their plas that their salt is plastics free. And I think that's important if you're like me, if you're looking for something out there we can buy that we can have some confidence in that it doesn't have plastic in our salt. The second brand that I found and I'm familiar with, and that's real salt. You may be familiar with it as well. Now, real salt is mined from ancient deposits from seabeds that were created millenniums ago. So let's see what real salt has to say. Has real salt been contaminated by plastic? And what real salt says is plastic's everywhere, and that's becoming a problem. There's growing concern about the prevalence of plastic and its impact on our planet in ways we might not have foreseen. Exposure to leaked plastic in food has been linked to a laundry list of serious health problems, such as cancer, birth defects, reproductive issues, decreased immunity, and endocrine disruption. We now have evidence that plastic is making its way into our food sources, and a recent article in The Guardian shines a light on research showing plastic and sea salt. As you can imagine, as a result of this, we've been fielding questions from customers worried that real salt has been affected. Before we dig into the issue, we want to state unequivocally that real salt, natural sea salt, is not and cannot be affected by plastic contamination. 
Understanding the concern with sea salt will help you see why this is the case. The Guardian article reveals that researchers in Spain have declared that sea products are irredeemably contaminated by microplastics, an edict that is somewhat alarming. One sea product is, of course, sea salt. Recently, a study conducted at the University of Minnesota showed that Americans could be ingesting a surprising amount of plastic microparticles from sea salt if they are following the recommended dietary guidelines for sodium. And as you probably know, the vast majority of Americans are getting a lot more salt than that. While no one concretely knows the effects of ingesting plastic, it seems like it's probably not a particularly good thing. And I will agree with that wholeheartedly. According to The Guardian, some reachers, such as Manson, according to The Guardian, some researchers, such as Mason, now believe sea salt could be more vulnerable to plastic contamination because of how it is made through a process of dehydration of seawater. The aforementioned Mason is Sherry Mason, the scientist who led the University of Minnesota research. She is interviewed in the piece. She is quoted as saying it's not that the sea salt in China is worse than sea salt in America. It's that all sea salt, because it's all coming from the same origins, is going to have a consistent problem. I think that this is what we're seeing. While we have a great respect for science, Mason got that part wrong. All sea salt does not come from the same origins. Source matters, especially in this case. While many sea salts are made by dehydrating seawater, as Mason says, not all is. Real salt, natural sea salt, is harvested from an ancient seabed a couple of hours south of Salt Lake City, Utah. The sea existing during the Jurassic period, long before plastic and other modern pollutants existed, and then receded. Its remnants were buried under protective volcanic ash that kept it entirely unpolluted and unchanged for millions of years. You can learn more about that here. Because it is not sourced from a current ocean, our changing way of life does not affect the cleanliness and purity of real salt, unrefined sea salt. Now what is important here is not only real salt mined from an ancient seabed, the most important fact is it's unrefined sea salt. We also use clean mining techniques to harvest real salt, employing hydraulic powered stainless steel rotary tools and no explosives, further protecting it from contamination. If you are concerned about ingesting plastic from sea salt, we suggest you switch to real salt, ancient natural sea salt, unspoiled by the pollution we humans create and mine in America with an awareness of environmental impact. It's a safe choice now and always. And there you have it, folks. Right now, those are the only two brands I could find. It was Jacobson's and Real Salt. Now, I'm a little skeptical about Real Salt because the fact is they say it's unrefined and that may be totally true but I wonder if in any way it's washed. If indeed it is washed, then it could have a possibility of being contaminated with microplastics. As I showed you, municipal water is polluted with microplastics. So y'all, I hope the video was informative. It gave you enough information where you can make a decision regarding not only your own health, but the health of your family, friends, your children, and loved ones. I know it's opened my eyes, and I will make the appropriate adjustments. Now, I'm not going to throw out all my salt. What I have stored back will basically just sit. It doesn't go bad. I will be purchasing both Jacobson's and Real Salt in the very near future. And I'm going to give them a try. Once they come in, 
I may do a video and share that with you. Let me know if you'd be interested. So with that said, we're going to end the video. I know it's been another long one, but I do like to make sure you have all the information you need that I think I would need to make a good decision regarding your lives. As always, folks, till I see you in the next video, y'all take care, stay safe out there, and God bless each and every one of you. Goodbye for now.